Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Southeast Chapter um, Quarterly Educational Meeting. We thank you for coming out tonight um, to hear about renal replacement therapy in the ICU. We typically start all our meetings by stating the chapter mission and vision. The chapter's mission is to emulate SCCM's mission, which is to secure the highest quality of care for all critically ill and injured patients in the Southeast region by providing educational and research opportunities, as well as promoting multi-professional collaboration. Our vision is that all critically ill and injured persons in the Southeast region will receive care from a present integrated team of dedicated, trained intensivists and critical care specialists, as well as inspire new leaders and providers of critical care in the region. Um, with that, this past month, we had the pleasure of seeing many chapter members at Congress. We'd like to thank everyone who made the time to come out to our meeting. Uh, it was great seeing everyone exchanging ideas, and we look forward to working together this next year. We'd also like to sincerely thank uh, Megan Van Burkle Patel for her chapter leadership as president for the past two years. She did amazing things, and she leaves big shoes to fill for us this year. With that said, we'd like to welcome the new executive board, including Ashley the Priest, who's, who will be serving as president, um, Ahyan Jun, who will be serving as treasurer, as well as Maria Zorni, who's serving as secretary. Uh, a big welcome to all our new committee members and committee chairs as well. Uh, we appreciate everything that you guys will be doing for the chapter. We appreciate your time, your talent, and your commitment to chapter advancement. Uh, tonight, we'd also like to thank all our sponsors, including Theravance, La Jolla, and Allergan for their continued support of the chapter. I'd like to go over a few upcoming events um, that are coming up. We have a busy calendar over the next few months. Um, during the month of March, we have our meeting today, but we also are hosting our bite-sized lectures via webinar on necrotizing enter um, enterocolitis in neonates on March the 19th from 12.30 uh, to 1.30 p.m. There, there will be emails for you to sign up if you'd like. Um, during the month of April, the chapter will also be hosting its Twitter journal club. More information to come. Uh, May is National Critical Care Awareness and Recognition Month, and we're asking everyone to turn their ICU blue on Friday the 15th. Um, and the chapter will also be providing uh, interested hospitals and institutions with a stipend to buy a small treat for uh, their staff. If you work with an excellent bedside nurse who goes above and beyond to advance practice in your unit, please take the opportunity to nominate her to the Barbara McLean Contribution uh, to Critical Care Excellence Award. Um, the winner is typically announced during the uh, during May NCCRM month, um, but nominations will be solicited earlier, so look out for emails for that. Our next quarterly meeting will be on June 11th and will focus on uh, PICS and post ICU care. So stay tuned for that. Look out for the emails to sign up. With that, it is my pleasure to be introducing our speaker tonight, Dr. Michael Connor. Um, he was born and raised in Atlanta. He completed his bachelor's degree at the University of Notre Dame and returned to Georgia to attend the medical school at the Medical College of Georgia. Uh, he completed his dual training in both internal medicine and pediatrics at Brown University in Providence, Rhode Island, uh, where he became interested in both critical care medicine as well as nephrology with a particular interest in acute care nephrology in the adult ICU. Dr. Connor completed fellowship training in adult nephrology and critical care medicine at the Cleveland Clinic in Cleveland, Ohio. And after that, he joined fa the um, Emory faculty uh, School of Medicine back in September of 2010, and he currently serves as associate professor. Dr. Connor's clinical and academic interests are focused heavily on critical care and especially acute nephrology in, um, issues and the critically ill. He is an internationally recognized expert on acute renal replacement therapies, AKI, antimicrobial dosing in AKI, volume management, as well as hemodynamic support in the ICU. All right. Well, I'll let you uh, listen to our great speaker tonight. Here you go. All right. Thank you. Um, so while I'm getting the uh, microphone on for the um, webinar, um, let me first tell everybody on the computer that uh, I will likely leave um, the view of the camera up here that is the web camera because I like to move around when I give my talk. 
So as long as you can see my slides and hear my voice, you should be okay. So um, the team wanted, uh, the, the leadership asked me to talk about renal replacement therapy in the ICU and what are the things that we can do to, um, to maximize the chance of success and to opportunity for our patients to get better. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. Um, I have a few disclosures, but none of these are particularly pertinent to what I'm gonna talk about, but it's very important for me to, um, to let you know these. Um, okay, so let's get into this. What are the objectives? I want you to understand the spectrum of renal replacement therapy options in the ICU and how to select them. I want you to describe the studies regarding timing of dialysis initiation and to think about how do we decide to start dialysis in the ICU. Um, it's more complicated than you think. And then we want to talk about implementing methods to improve the chance of successful outcomes because we want our patients to survive and thrive and liberate from the ICU. This is the outline we're gonna talk about um, and uh, it'll sort of be divided into two halves. The first half is gonna be renal replacement therapy options and timing discussions, and we'll use a case to help us go through all of that. And then the last half is gonna be talking about what is optimal CRT and optimal dialysis. I am not going to be covering the debate about intermittent hemo, prolonged intermittent renal replacement therapy, or uh, CRT. I'm assuming since most of you are ICU doctors uh, and nurses and pharmacists and, and you know, nutrition support experts and respiratory therapists that you all prefer CRT in general. Uh, so we'll just move forward with that. Okay, so I always wanna start with a case. I'm just gonna blow through this very, very quickly. 37-year-old uh, guy presented with acute onset of severe abdominal pain and shortness of breath. In the ER, he was known to be a profound epigastric tenderness, a firm abdomen, tachycardia, hypotensive, mildly febrile. He had a lipase of 1,100. Creatinine was 1 1.2 on presentation. We don't know what his pre-morbid creatinine was prior to him getting sick. That's a very important thing. Even though this creatinine looks normal, we don't really know if it's normal for this patient. And the CT of the abdomen and pelvis showed a lot of marked inflammation of the pancreas with no evidence of pancreas, pancreatic necrosis. So he has severe acute pancreatitis. We don't see this as frequently as we used to, uh, but he has severe acute pancreatitis. We know that that's gonna lead to a big inflammatory response and lots of uh, issues down the line. So uh, much to my chagrin, he got 10 liters of hyperchloremic 0.9% sodium chloride as volume resuscitation. This was about a decade ago, so maybe not uh, what we would choose nowadays to do that. Uh, he, uh, in the first 24 hours, he was started on some low-dose pressors. He wasn't requiring too much, but he's on some low-dose pressors. He's only made 360 cc's of urine in the first uh, overnight period, first 24 hours. Creatinine is up to 1.9 despite the dilutional effect of 10 liters of volume expansion. That should be quite concerning. He's a little bit acidemic and he's progressively getting more hypoxic with infiltrates and requiring intubation. So let me ask you a few questions about this with just a show of hands for the audience here. Those of you who are on the webinar, obviously you can't uh, weigh in on this, but does AKI impact this patient's outcomes? Yes, okay. Good, we'll talk about that a little bit. Does he need dialysis right now? Some people are saying yes, some people are sort of doing the head nod, they're not quite sure. I think that's also a challenge, we'll talk about that. And then just for you to think about as we go through this is the question of how do we provide dialysis to maximize the chance of survival? Because it's not just the magic of the blood circulating through a machine that's gonna help this patient survive. In fact, uh, it may not be. In fact, we have to be very mindful of what we're doing and using the machine to accomplish what we need it to accomplish. So let me just remind you in the first question about does AKI impact this patient's outcome? So the AKI incidence in this very large international multinational epidemiology incidence um, trial of AKI showed that AKI in the ICU occurs about 55 to 60% of patients, okay? So the majority of your patients in your ICU are gonna have some form of AKI. A fair number of it is pretty mild. Not so many people stop at this moderate stage of AKI, and then most of these, and a lot of the plurality of patients become severe AKI, okay? Stage three AKI. So um, that's really important. How, unless you work in a post-surgical cardiac surgery ICU, if you're working in a MICU or a general SICU or in a burn ICU, are 60% of your patients vented on any given day? 
Not always, right? I mean, we got a lot of GI bleeders that come in, a lot of people who get extubated in the OR from a, uh, an extensive lap coli, right? So I mean, 60% AKI, it's amongst the most common diagnosis we have in the ICU. Those who receive dialysis are somewhere between 12 to 15%, okay? So for context, we have about 5.7, 5.8 million ICU admissions every year in the United States. That means with this incident level, we have about 3.3 million cases of ICU AKI in the United States every year. How many people die of CAUDIs according to the CDC? Somewhere in the 20 to 30,000 per range. That's terrible, okay? That's 20 to 30,000 people who supposedly die of CAUDIs. We have 3.3 million people in the United States that are getting AKI in the ICU. How do, we ask, how do we know AKI early and how do we have an opportunity to intervene on it early? By having Foley's in and having accurate, accurate measurements of urine output. That's been shown in many, many studies, okay? So we have to balance the Foley police with this problem. All right, what about mortality? If you have only mild AKI, you're two times more likely to die. If you have severe AKI, you're seven times more likely to die. So to put it mildly, sick kidneys are very radioactive in the ICU, okay? So it gets me thinking though. Certainly dialysis technology has advanced in the last 70 years, okay? This is the rotating drum from the 1940s to do dialysis. And now we have these fancy machines, right? But despite that, we still have an unacceptably high mortality rate of anywhere from 40 to 60% of patients who die if you look at incident studies uh, and outcome studies. So the question is, what's the key to unlock success? How do we make sure that our patients, or how do we help our patients get better to lower that um, mortality rate? The first is to recognize that dialysis is a spectrum, okay? It's a spectrum of therapies from outpatient conventional dialysis, targeted intermittent hemodialysis, prolonged intermittent, and continuous renal replacement therapy. These are not competing modalities. These are not one is better than the other. These are, uh, these are modalities that are complementary, that work together to accomplish the goals. So you have to think to yourself, what are we trying to do with the dialysis? So CRT is probably better, it, it, it's not probably, it is better in cardiovascular hemodynamic instability. It helps maintain metabolic acidosis, volume control, and cerebral edema. But it's not perfect. It does not remove things quickly. So if you have somebody who's ingested a bunch of ethylene glycol, they have a K of nine, okay? They're super acidemic with like a pH of 6.8 it's not gonna fix those problems quickly. And sometimes we have to use intermittent hemodialysis, even in an unstable patient, to fix things more quickly. So the first aspect of dialysis in the ICU is to decide what are we using it for and make sure we're using a modality that is designed to treat that problem. Okay, that's really important. What about outcomes? So is death really an acceptable outcome to be looking at? I told you that 60% of these patients die, but they're also sick, very, very sick otherwise. Maybe death really isn't the outcome that we should be saying. We got on dialysis and you, know, you died. Maybe we should be thinking about dialysis as a part of life support, and maybe its role on some other things would be helpful, and death is sort of a secondary thing that maybe we shouldn't be focused on. So things like renal recovery. Is there a mode that's better for renal recovery? Volume control, volume removal. If we're trying to treat volume removal, then successful removal of volume is an outcome that's important. Time on the ventilator, ICU length of stay, hospital length of stay. If there's one mode that's better or if one mode in a certain patient is better than another, then we, that might be the outcome in question. Cost, what's more costly? Uh, renal replacement therapy issues. So things like access, bleeding, circuit failures. If you're having circuit clotting, you may need to think about, maybe I need to think about a different modality. And then what is the blood pressure effects of dialysis? All right, so what are the key issues then with that case that we discussed before? What are the key issues? When should we start therapy? <laughs> That's a pretty important one. And then what are the critical elements if we're starting therapy? How can we try to make sure that we're doing it successfully so that we're not 
harming the patient with dialysis, but we're using dialysis to potentially modify something that can help the patient get better. Things like dose of dialysis, anticoagulation, vascular access. So we're gonna talk about this first, okay? So this is the rest of the first half of the talk. So what is the data out there and what do things say? So the global guidelines for nephrology are called the KDGO guidelines. They cover everything in nephrology. There is a section associated with acute kidney injury, and they say that to initiate dialysis emergently for life-threatening changes in fluid electrolyte acid base uh, balance, okay? So our patient that I showed you that case before, that patient did not have a life-threatening indication, correct? Okay. KDGO does go on to say that we really need to consider the broader clinical context of the patient and the presence of conditions that may be able to be modified by dialysis that could impact this patient, okay? So things like fluid balance and other sorts of stuff like that. And not just looking at the BUN and creatinine or the potassium. We have several studies that have tried to look at this in meta-analysis that sort of suggest that maybe starting dialysis earlier is better. So let me touch the next few minutes to talk about three recent studies uh, to go through that you may have heard about in the literature, okay? These are three studies on the timing of dialysis. The first was the Akiki trial. This was published in 2016. It was done in adult ICU patients who had KDGO stage three. So this is advanced AKI before they could even enroll in the trial, okay? And they had to be on the mechanical ventilator or on pressors. They got random to early dialysis, which meant early within six hours of meeting these criteria, or a delayed dialysis approach in which they either waited for oliguria or anuria for greater than 72 hours or some sort of emergent reason to start. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, so what did this trial show? It showed no difference. Okay. Another important thing is it showed that everybody in the early strategy got dialysis because they got started right away. But in the delayed strategy, only about 50% of the patients actually ended up requiring dialysis, which meant the other 50% may have had spontaneous renal recovery and didn't need dialysis, or they died, one or the other. We don't really know, okay? All right, let's move on to the next trial. This was the Elaine trial, published at almost the identical time in uh, a different journal. They looked again at adult patients. This time they looked at stage two AKI. So this was an earlier stage of AKI, and they had to have uh, signs of ATN and then be sick, okay? They got randomized to early dialysis, again, within eight hours of reaching stage two AKI or delayed dialysis, which again, was within 12 hours of getting to stage three AKI or some sort of emergent need for it, okay? And this was a single center trial that looked at 250 patients, and they showed a significant improvement in survival, decreased death with the early dialysis, okay? So we had two trials exactly the same time showing two totally different things. They also showed that the duration of dialysis was less than the early group, the hospital stay was less, the duration of mechanical ventilator was less. So all sorts of things looked better by the early group. What about the third trial? This is the most recent trial, to date the largest trial, although there is another one coming out that's gonna be about 3,000 patients. This is the ideal ICU trial, again done in France. This was septic shock specifically now, patients, and they had to have, again, KDGO stage three. So fairly advanced AKI. They got early dialysis within 12 hours or delayed dialysis, which was if it persisted for 48 hours or some sort of emergency treatment. What did they show? So they enrolled patients over four years. They got this many patients enrolled, but they had to stop this trial because they felt like they were not going to reach any statistically meaningful endpoints. And so therefore they stopped the trial, not because the treatment was futile, but because continuing the trial was futile, okay? 
And so as a result, it doesn't take any rocket science to realize that they show no difference again. Okay? So now we have three trials that are showing different results. How do we put this together? So let me walk you through at least how I think about putting this together. First of all, these trials are not equal. Okay? These two trials enrolled patients at a fairly advanced stage of AKI. This trial did not enroll patients at an advanced stage of AKI, at a much earlier stage of AKI. Okay? These patients were much more fluid overloaded at the time of enrollment. One other important thing is that this trial put everybody on CRT when they started dialysis, and these groups used a lot of intermittent hemo and other sorts of stuff like that. Okay? So there are some important differences. So, but we're still left with the fact that only about 50 to 60% of patients in the delayed group ever got dialysis in the ideal ICU and the Akiki trial. So we have to bear that in mind that if we're starting everybody really early, we might be starting patients who don't actually need dialysis, and that's a question. So if you look at these subgroups, and bear in mind this is my analysis, Every other people have said the same thing, so many other people have independently come up with this same subgroup. But if you look here, if you started dialysis early, you got 48.5% mortality. If you were on the delayed group and you never needed dialysis because you got better, you did pretty well. You only had 37.1% mortality. But if you were in the delayed group and you did ultimately require dialysis, you did substantially worse than the patients who were in the early group. Okay? So it suggests that in the Akiki trial, there is a cost for waiting. If you wait and you get better, great. But if you wait and don't get better, there may be a cost. And the ideal ICU trial, again, that showed no difference, suggested the same thing. Okay? So again, this was the survival in the early group that got dialysis. This was in the delay group who got dialysis. The delay group who didn't get dialysis did better. And then the people who got dialysis because they met those emergency criteria for dialysis, they did substantially worse. So again, waiting for some emergent indication to start dialysis seems to come at some sort of cost that is hard to do. So if we go back to this patient, if we go back to this patient and we think about what would we do, how do we think about this, and what do we, how do we move forward with this? So we have to take that, that patient has no obvious emergent indications. I think we can agree on that. There's no obvious emergent indications on that patient. So we have to think about how do we factor in, should we start him now, should we wait and see if he's gonna spontaneously recover, how do we factor in all this? So we have to think about what's the severity of AKI, what are the trajectories like, how likely is it that this patient's gonna get better in the next day or two, okay? We need to think about what's the severity of critical illness. If they're super critically ill, then there's probably not a good likelihood they're gonna get better. What are the potential risks of dialysis, right? The main risk of dialysis nowadays is risks associated with the vascular access, CLABSIs, other sorts of traumas related to the vascular access. The actual dialysis machine itself doesn't usually introduce a heck of a lot of risk, but if there's circuit failures or if you're using anticoagulation, you could have some bleeding issues or you need some transfusion. So there's some risk associated with it. Other factors, what's the availability of machines, availability of staff, how do we make these decisions? And if we think about our patient being on one of these curves and we're seeing the patient here, it's really hard to know which direction they're going to go, okay? I'm gonna come back to maybe how you can make some of those decisions in a couple of minutes. I do wanna point out that I told you that people who have AKI, they die very frequently, okay? And the more severe AKI you have, the more likely you are to die. But this group did a very interesting study where they took, uh, they looked at what's called the MIMIC2 database, which is a huge database maintained by uh, Harvard on critically ill patients in the Harvard system that's open and free access to people who wanna do research on this database, okay? And they looked at what is driving the mortality in these patients who have AKI. And what they showed is, is that the really those excess mortality you see from stage three, stage two, stage one AKI compared to no AKI is really driven by fluid overload, hyperkalemia, and metabolic acidosis. And if you correct for those things, and you have statistical models where you can correct for that, then there really isn't a huge increase in risk of death. So our patients are not dying from AKI. They're dying from the complications of AKI. 
So that's really important, okay? And that's why it suggests that if we wait too long to do dialysis, we may get ourselves into trouble, okay? Let me take a little bit of a look at this and just zoom in on one area. So the combination of fluid overload and AKI is terrible, okay? So if you're fluid overloaded, greater than 10% increase in your baseline weight, okay? Because we don't gain weight in the ICU for the most part, if we, unless you have an external fixator, okay? Other, you're not gaining muscle or fat, you're gaining water weight. So if your weights increase 10% from baseline and you meet that at the time the dialysis has started, you're two times more likely to die, okay? Two times more likely to die than if you don't have that. And there is a, clearly a dose response relationship. So the more fluid you accumulate, whether you're dialyzed or not, the more likely you are to die. And this holds true even if you correct for severity of illness and other sorts of issues like this. This is not just that the sicker patients get more fluid. I don't have time to go into that today. I'm happy to come back and give another lecture about how fluid overload is deadly in the ICU. And the number of days in which we're getting dialysis where fluid overloaded was also associated with outcomes. And just to show, this was a US um, patient sample. This exact same thing has been shown in Europe in a very large trial as well. So the question then is to dialyze or not to dialyze. How do we focus this? We have to weigh all of these other factors and we have to decide what's going on for this patient, okay? So what's the challenge? So the challenge in decision-making for renal replacement therapy is that we have time. Our patient is in the ICU and is progressing in their trajectory over the course of minutes to hours to days. And if we start really early, we would probably call that preemptive dialysis because we patient may not really have any real indications. There's urgent dialysis where things are sort of getting significantly important. And then there's sort of the emergent dialysis where you know, the patient's super acidemic, hyperkalemic or other. As we progress along here, the AKI complications are gonna go up and get worse, right? Make sense? As the complication rates go up, usually the organ failures go up, the chance of actually making a difference in this patient probably is getting worse, okay? And the benefit for dialysis as the complication rates go up and the organ failures go up and the futility and the severity of the patient goes up is probably going down, okay? So if you're starting way down here, you may not really be getting any of the benefit of dialysis because you're dealing with all the complications of AKI and all the end organ failures related to all the problems. Look at this a little bit different. This is not just a one-way street though. So if we have the benefit and the complications that we're balancing, we also have to remember that there could potentially be a harm from starting dialysis too early. So if we start really early, there could be a harm, and that harm is clearly gonna go down as the indications and the complication rates go up, okay? The other thing to realize is that there may be a harm from starting dialysis too early, but as we've shown here, there clearly can be a harm from starting dialysis too late. And the challenge is to decide when do we start? When do we pick, okay? And the, what might be an appropriate start for somebody may be too late for another person. So too early for one person may be too late for another person. So how do we put this all together? When we're making decisions and we're trying to solve a, a problem like this patient, it's good to think about things in terms of a step Y, is how do we make these decisions? So we need to identify the problem first. I know that's a problem in American politics nowadays because we can't seem to agree on number one, so we can't even make it around this anymore, okay? Then we have to develop alternatives, select the best plan, implement, and then look and see if our solution worked. So in our patient, in our case that we're talking about, the patient has AKI, he's oligaric. It's not terrible AKI, but he clearly has AKI and he's oligaric. He's volume overloaded, he's 10 liters fluid up. He's getting some acute respiratory failure. He's a bit acidemic and he's quite critically ill. So the decisions are, do we start or do we not for that patient? And I would suggest that we should view this and, and many others have recommended that we need to view this as a balancing act. We need to decide what is the renal demand and what's the renal capacity. If the kidney is good and it can handle everything that we're throwing at it, solute, 
disease, acid-based, drugs, fluid, then you can probably hold off. But if there's a huge mismatch between the renal capacity and the renal demand, something needs to fill that gap. And that usually needs to be dialysis. I'm also gonna show you that there's a couple of trials that suggest this. So this was a trial that looked at early versus uh, late dialysis. I'm not gonna get into this too much. It was a very small trial. It was a pilot trial. It, it didn't answer the question of early versus late. But they used a furosemide stress test. Okay, remember, Lasix is not a nephrotoxin. I know that that might be heresy. It's not a nephrotoxin, okay? You're not gonna kill your patient giving them a dose of Lasix. And it can be incredibly diagnostic to what the renal capacity is on the patient. So in this, they gave a furosemide stress test and ultimately they, were, they enrolled the non-responders, okay? That's what they were trying to do. So in the patients who didn't respond, they randomized them to early versus late, but basically everybody ended up getting dialysis, okay? Whereas the patients who responded and were excluded from the trial, very few of them ended up needing dialysis. And this has been shown in other trials, that your response to Lasix gives you a window into whether or not this patient is somebody who is gonna potentially recover and never need dialysis, versus the patient who is not going to recover in the short term and will likely need dialysis. It can discriminate those two patient populations. And I use that all the time. If I'm on the fence with this patient, like we talked about, and I give him a dose of Lasix, and he has a, a good dose, an appropriate dose for the furosemide stress test, which we can talk about later, okay, and they make urine, then there's not a lot of a whole other reasons to start dialysis on this patient. I may let him go and see what happens. But if I give him diuretics and he's not making urine, then I probably are gonna say, well, I don't want all these complications to start accumulating, making it more and more difficult for his outcome, okay? So let's just say, because this is a lecture about dialysis, we did a furosemide stress test, he didn't respond, so we're gonna start CRT, okay? We're not gonna get into IHD or CRT, I told you that, we're just gonna start CRT. So then the question becomes, what's optimal dialysis, okay? So if we reach the end of the first half of the talk, I want you to take a little bit of a pause because I may have put many of you to sleep, okay? Enjoy a little bit of a joke for a minute uh, and try to wake back up, okay? Try to wake back up uh, so that we can talk about the rest of this. All right, we ready to move on? Everyone's ready? Do we need to stretch first? No? Okay, all right, let's move on. So what then is optimal CRT? Because just having the machine spinning is not optimal CRT, okay? So I think there are six steps for optimal dialysis. The first is there has to be close collaboration. Even if you're working in one of these hospitals where the intensivists are doing all the dialysis themselves, there really needs to be intense and close collaboration. And the reason for that is that CRT impacts many things, okay? And I, I know I'm a little biased in this, but as a nephrologist, I will tell you that there's many times the AKI is not related to ATN or to some perfusion-mediated thing. And I'm pretty sure most intensivists are not very good at diagnosing acute GN, anti-GBM disease, ANCO-associated vasculitis. Even when there's pulmonary hemorrhage, I've seen intensivists miss pulmonary renal syndromes and other sorts of stuff like that, okay? So I think there should be close collaboration. One of the most important things about close collaboration is establishing our goal for dialysis. And this should be really done every day. Why are we continuing to do dialysis today? Or why are we starting to do dialysis today? Because the goal for dialysis informs how we prescribe dialysis, which modality we use. I guarantee you, if on day 10, the goal for dialysis is to remove three liters of fluid, I guarantee you that if the nurse is aware that that's the goal, he or she is gonna be much more successful at keeping track of I's and O's and accomplishing the goal. So there has to be collaboration to establish the goals. We need to keep the CRT machine running, okay? We do that by establishing and maintaining a great vascular access and using CRT anticoagulation of some sort. Anticoagulation needs to be an opt-out, not an opt-in. It should not be something that we start only when our machines are having trouble. 
It should be something that we start from the get-go unless there's a reason not to do it. So for example, at Grady, we are in the works of finally getting a citrate protocol here, but right now we only have heparin. So our choices are heparin versus no anticoagulation. If you've got a lot of risk for bleeding, then we can't use heparin. But if you don't have risk for bleeding, the ICU team should really volunteer that to the nephrologist when they're getting ready to write the orders. I'm not worried about bleeding, so it's perfectly okay to use heparin. Let's use it, okay? We need to address the medication dosing daily while the patients are on CRT. We need to ensure appropriate nutrition support, and we need to avoid complications. We're gonna go through each one of these points for the rest of the talk, okay? High level, if you want to go into these points in more depth, you need to come to a two-day CRT training course that we run at UAB, not a, a 30 minute lecture on these important points, okay? So let's talk about this first point. Okay, so we need to remember that dialysis is spectrum. These are not competing, these are complementary modalities. So our goal for therapy should inform what we pick, okay? I have peritoneal dialysis up here because in many parts of the world, they don't have CRT and we use peritoneal dialysis for continuous dialysis in the ICU. Uh, even in some large academic centers in the US, they're not using CRT, they're putting PD catheters in patients, okay? The next is dialysis dose. So by dialysis dose, we are asking how quickly or aggressively are we clearing things like BUN, creatinine, potassium, and acid base, okay? There's been lots of studies on this that show that there's no benefit to continued exposure of high dose CRT, okay? So doing lots of dialysis for days and days and days on end doesn't help the patient, okay? But dose is not static. So that doesn't mean that just because high dose isn't better in the long term, that in that first 24 hours when the patient's pH is 6.9, they may need a higher dose, and then we need to revisit that when things change and stabilize, okay? And then when the patients are at steady state, CRT dose should be targeted to deliver a total effluent flow rate, which I'm not gonna define for you, but it's, how, it's all the stuff that's coming out the back end of the CRT machine of 20 to 25 mLs per kilo per hour in which the patient su successfully receives. Okay, so oftentimes we prescribe a little higher than that in the short term because to account for um, downtime. CRT and PERT are definitely more successful at removing, dial at removing volume. I'm not gonna get into this at length. This has been shown in many, many studies. If you are fluid overloaded, even if you are hemodynamically stable, i.e. off pressors, you're not usually that hemodynamically stable that the big machine can suck out five liters in three hours, okay? All right, so unequivocally, CRT and PERT are better at fluid removal. So if that's your goal of treatment, then that's what you need to be using. All right, let's move on to the next step. Keep the machine running. Keep the machine running. Okay, so the first is let's talk about CRT anticoagulation, and then I'm gonna talk about dialysis vascular access, okay? I told you that anticoagulation is strongly recommended. All the global guidelines highly recommend uh, anticoagulation. And in fact, they strongly endorse regional citrate anticoagulation, okay? For those of you who don't know what this is, this is using citrate in the CRT circuit to bind all the free calcium. The blood cannot clot then. And then once the blood mixes back with the patient's blood that has calcium, the effect of the anticoagulation is reversed and uh, the patient sees no systemic manifestations of anticoagulation. It's highly effective. The alternatives are heparin, therapeutic, subtherapeutic, or pre-filter heparin. Okay. Oh, I just wanted to say on the heparin side of stuff real quick. If you can give heparin in the pre-filter position, whether it's therapeutic or subtherapeutic heparin, you should definitely do that. Okay. The reason for that is that if you give heparin into a peripheral IV or a central line, then that heparin is dissolving in all of the patient's blood volume, okay? And they will have a heparin level of, let's pick a number, 0.3.
So the blood that goes out to the CRT circuit will also have a heparin level of 0.3, okay? Heparin is not removed by dialysis. So if you put it into the machine, the machine is gonna then carry it into the patient and you can measure levels and do everything else like that, okay? But if you put it into the machine first, before it dissolves into total blood volume, then the heparin level inside the machine will be much higher than the heparin level inside the patient. Does that make sense? So when using heparin, it's always recommended that you think about putting it in the pre-filter position. And you don't technically need any different order to put it in the pre-filter position. If I order high dose heparin for a PE, it's ordered intravenously. If you put it in the pre-filter position, where is that ending up? into an intravenous catheter and going into the patient, okay? All right, let's talk about vascular access. There's a lot of difference of opinions on this, but in the US, we strongly recommend the right IJ position first, the left IJ next, and the femoral last. The reason for that is that the femoral position uh, probably has higher rates of infection in most patients that are uh, obese, if you define obesity as a BMI of greater than 28, okay? The studies that have looked at safety of femoral lines have shown that in skinny people, like most of us sitting in the room, a femoral line doesn't necessarily have a hugely increased risk of infection. But a lot of the patients we're dialyzing are obese. Uh, and so the IJ position is probably preferred. If you're using the IJ site, the tip, the goal is to have the tip in the caval atrial junction or in the right atrium. I'm gonna show you that in a second. The catheter length, if you're a normal size adult, is a right IJ 20 centimeter, left IJ 24 centimeter, and a femoral of 24 to 30 centimeter. This does not hold true if you are a giant or you are very small. Okay? All right. Now, let me just show you why we recommend these lengths. So this was a really good study. This best study had been done on this. They randomized patients to a short or a long IJ catheter. Okay? And the site was determined by availability. So the study didn't tell them if they had to put it in the right or the left side, okay? They just said, if you put it in the right and you're long, it needs to be 20 centimeters. And if you're in the left, it needs to be 20 centimeters. And if you're in the short group, it needs to be this other length. And what they showed was that by using the longer catheter, they got all the, almost all the patients into the right atrium or very close to it. And in the short catheter, they had the patients mostly in the SVC. The catheter tips were in the SVC. And what they showed was every metric of dialysis success was better with the long catheter group, okay? And there was really no difference in any sort of complication rates. So these catheters that we use nowadays, especially the ones that we use in most hospitals, are soft and perfectly capable of sitting in the right atrium without causing problems. So this tip, right here at the cable atrial junction or maybe at the beginning of the right atrium is good, okay? This one, not good, okay? This one coming from the left subclavian, way too short, not good. These catheters will not work and you will have trouble, okay? All right, what about addressing medication dosing? Discuss med dosing daily. Drugs that are not, some drugs that are not cleared by intermittent hemodialysis are in fact cleared a lot by CRT. So looking at simply, is this drug dialyzable or not? Rita will tell you that that does not work, okay? You have to know things like molecular weight and charge and other stuff, which I don't expect people here to necessarily know all of that for all these drugs. Medication clearance is dependent on CRT dose. So what is that effluent flow rate, okay? So the higher the effluent flow rate, the more you're gonna clear. The initial good place to start on your dosing is to take your effluent flow rate, which is in mLs per hour, and divide that by 60. And that's giving you a good initial estimate of your CRT-related creatinine clearance. So if the drug says you need to dose it X, Y, in a certain fashion for a, for a creatinine clearance of 30, and that's what your CRT is giving you, then that's a good place to start on the drug dosing. Take home message, you need to hire more ICU clinical pharmacists. I hope Rondell is hearing this. All right. 
ensure appropriate nutrition support. We've got one burn surgeon in here, an intensivist, so I'm sure that he is going to agree with nutrition support. All right? Let's talk about nutrition support. So what is nutrition support during dialysis? So first of all, ICU patients are very frequently malnourished. So they're already starting, whether, I don't care which ICU you're in, if they're in there for more than a couple of days, they're starting to get malnourished, okay? And CRT, any renal replacement therapy, but particularly CRT, contributes to malnutrition because it's running all the time, removing things like proteins, essential amino acids, vitamins, micronutrients. These things your kidney does not put out in your urine because it has all this fancy tubule equipment to reabsorb all this stuff, okay? It's all filtered by the glomerulus, but all your nephron reabsorbs all this stuff, so you don't put this stuff out in your urine. But the dialysis machine does not do that. If it's filtered, it goes out and goes down the drain, okay? So I, in my notes, like to talk about it as CRT-specific augmented nutrition support. I recommend a lot of times that when you see my notes, it'll say, we need to start CRT-specific augmented nutrition support. So what does that mean? The first is you have to increase protein intake. So most nutritionists and most ICU folks will tell you that in, in general ICU patients, not burn patients, but in general ICU patients, you need somewhere around 1.2 to maybe 1.7 grams per kilo per day of protein, okay? These are very hard studies to do because in order to do this in CRT and to really measure this, we would need to collect all of the effluent for a whole 24-hour period and then measure the nitrogen balance of that to measure all of this, okay? That's not easy to do when we're generating 70 liters of effluent in a 24-hour period, okay? I don't know many ICU rooms that could fit a jug that could hold 70 liters in it, all right? So the general recommendation is you should be giving protein at 2 to 2.5 grams per kilo per day in patients who are on CRT, okay? Now, there's a, who was at SCCM? There was a fantastic lecture about continuous versus bolus protein. I don't think we know the answer for that right now. And for CRT, we definitely don't know the answer. But think about, make sure these patients are getting enough protein. They also lose a lot of vitamins and micronutrients, and oftentimes they need supplements of things like thiamine, B6, folate, vitamin C, copper, and zinc, especially if they're on for more than a few days, okay? And we need to reassess how they're tolerating their nutrition. I do not believe in waiting seven days for TPN in these patients. Those patients were not included in those TPN trials. If you're on CRT by day three, day four, day five, you need to be on some form of nutrition support, and it needs to be at goal. And if you can't get it to goal with enteral, you need to think about TPN. And you need to check the blood levels of these various things and adjust them as needed. And I would encourage you to definitely think about checking things like vitamin C, vitamin A, carnitine, selenium, especially if you're having troubles with your patients getting off the ventilator, with wound healing, and other sorts of issues like that. Because I cannot tell you how many patients have almost no carnitine uh, after a week or two on dialysis, and you start supplementing it, and they start to, performing better on the vent and everything else like that. Okay? Lastly, avoiding complications. Hypophosphatemia, hypotension, and bleeding. So let's talk about hypophosphatemia first of all. Uh, so, First and foremost, you need to check the phosphorus daily when you're on CRRT, okay? It gets forgotten about all the time on daily labs. It needs to be checked daily. Low phosphorus on CRRT, if you develop a phosphorus of less than two when you're on CRRT, it doubles your risk of needing a trach. And it increases your time on the ventilator. The problem is, is that most hospitals, not here at Grady, but most hospitals are using CRT solutions that do not contain phosphorus. So you're dialyzing a patient against a zero phosphorus all the time. If we were dialyzing them against zero potassium, would you be supplementing potassium all the time? Yes, because potassium would be going low. So you're dialyzing them against zero phosphorus. Their phosphorus level will go low, which is why it needs to be checked. And you need to start thinking about uh, enteral supplements and IV supplements to try to prevent significant hypophosphatemia, okay? Especially as they're engrafting their skin grafts or their bone marrow is regenerating or they're recovering from sepsis or other sorts of stuff. CRT and PERT are unequivocally associated with less hypotension. 
Hypotension, though, is not only due to fluid removal. So even if we do no fluid removal and intermittent hemodialysis, we can cause hypotension simply by shifting BUN and creatinine and all the other solutes. So we need to individualize fluid removal and reassess frequently. And those of you who know me a lot know that I talk about de-resuscitating your patients early. Okay, the goal is ventilator liberation, not presser liberation. The final thing I'm gonna talk about is as we talk about improving ICU outcomes for these patients, we're gonna do excellent CRT by paying attention to these six steps every day, but we also have to treat the whole patient. We also have to treat the whole patient. Improving ICU outcomes requires us to do good nutrition support, ventilator liberation, uh, what's that one? Resolving delirium, early mobilization, preventing infections, uh, wound healing, and resolving hypervolemia. And resolving hypervolemia makes all the other things more uh, easily accomplished, okay? I would suggest that we should pick a curve that we would like our patient to be on for their volume status in the ICU, okay? If they just go up and up and up, they die. If they go up and then they sort of slowly continue to go up, they end up with PICs, trachs, disability, and on long-term vents, okay? And then, you know, more desirable is for us to stop accumulating volume and to eventually take volume off. The timing by which you take volume off is not entirely clear. I tend to accelerate this quite a lot in my ICU practice, and I think there's a lot of data that supports that, but we won't get into that right now. But I wanna show you that there may be some, there's some experimental studies coming out that may help us know when is it okay to take fluid off? When is it okay to start de-resuscitating the patient. How many people here do passive leg raises in the ICU? Almost everybody is raising their hand, okay? When you do passive leg raise, we know that we shouldn't be looking at change in MAP, right, or pulse pressure. We should be looking at change in cardiac output or cardiac index to figure out who is still volume responsive from a cardiac output perspective. Some really interesting people said, well, what if we do that in the reverse, okay? So if they, if they don't respond to passive leg raise, how does that impact on their dialysis? And what they actually showed was that if you don't respond, you don't get intradialytic hypotension. And if you do respond to the passive leg raise, you do get intradialytic hypotension, okay? So the reverse, when we're sort of day three, day four, we're no longer caring if we need more volume. We know they have enough volume. If you do the passive leg raise and they're not having a big increase in cardiac output, or stroke volume with that, then that might be the time to say, okay, it's now safe to start de-resuscitating this patient and pulling fluid off, okay? But that's very experimental and we need to work more on that. Now, the final part of improving ICU outcomes, who knows, who's heard about ICU liberation? Dr. Holder has, right? A lot of the nurses have. The A, B, C, D, E, F bundle, when is it gonna be like G, H, uh, I, J, K, L? D is not dialysis, by the way. It's not airway, breathing, circulation, dialysis. Uh, um, so what is the ABCD bundle? So just for those of you who don't know, A is assess, and this was just a nice acronym. None of this fits into what it's actually, but assess, prevent, and manage pain, okay? B is both an SAT and an SBT daily in appropriate patients. Choice, C is choice of analgesia and sedation. D is delirium, assess, prevent, management. E is early mobilization. Okay, that one makes sense, early mobilization. And F is family engagement and empowerment. Let's talk about early mobilization and exercise for a second as it pertains to CRT. So what do you think about CRT and mobilization? Yeah, most nurses tell me, no way. I'm not doing that, okay, I'm not doing that. But I'll show you, here's a patient we got out of bed who's running CRT through a femoral line, sitting almost upright. Okay, we had no trouble with this CRT while we were doing this. There was no issues with it. It worked fine. We didn't have any pressure issues. So is there any data on this? So there really is not a lot of data. But I would like to show you a couple of things that are coming out. So this group at Kentucky um, did a fantastic study uh, where they had a, a big multidisciplinary group to look at the safety and feasibility of, of early mobilization in CRT. It was a single center study. Their goal was just to develop a protocol to provide early uh, uh, rehabilitation, and it was a quality improvement project in four phases, team development, protocol creation, implementation, and looking for safety and feasibility, and then exploring some clinical outcomes. 
I'm not going to get into it. This was their huge safety screening thing about whether or not the patients could do it. I'm happy to send you the article or you have the reference. You can pull it yourself. And then they had sort of different levels of mobility that they uh, were trying to graduate these patients to while they were on CRT. And they ended up having 67 patients enrolled in the study. And many of these patients had multiple attempts at rehabilitation or early mobilization 40 times due to their safety screens and other things. They couldn't proceed with the rehabilitation session. But they did complete 112 rehabilitation sessions. And uh, they had uh, 67 patients at least underwent one. 72% of the sessions occurred with patients both on a ventilator and CRT, OK? And their primary outcome was safety. And they showed no major adverse events uh, or unintended CRT interruptions. And they had five minor adverse events, like two hy transient hypotensive orthostatic things that they had to sit the patient back down for, one bradycardic event, and one new onset atrial fibrillation. OK? So in general, it was pretty well tolerated. So I would suggest that patients with CRT can be mobilized, at least to chair, and at least sitting on the side of the bed oftentimes. And mobility, uh, but it needs to be part of a multidisciplinary team that includes safety evaluations. And I don't endorse any equipment. I don't endorse any equipment for CRT of one company versus another. But I will say that with the newer generation technology, people are thinking about this. So for example, the new Prismax has a battery that lasts 30 to 40 minutes. And the patient could, in theory, unplug the machine and actually sort of almost walk and push themselves with their CRT machine. OK? So for CRT and mobilization, I would say, yes, we need to try, but more research is needed. OK? So let's summarize all this. What are the conclusions and summary? This is a team sport. This is a team sport. And it requires everybody in the ICU to participate. OK? Second. Acute renal replacement therapy mode should be determined by what your goals are. The exact timing remains very elusive, and we're not quite sure. Start renal replacement therapy when you're going to get the maximal benefit to the patient to minimize other organ failures and complications related to the AKI, and that teamwork is required to provide successful dialysis. Remember your six steps for successful dialysis in the hospital. And Optimal dialysis, I guarantee you, will improve ICU liberation because optimal dialysis for sure will improve SAT and SBT success and vent liberation as you get fluid off. And successful dialysis, generally speaking, will help delirium. And as you get fluid off, that will also help delirium. But you also need to remember that we need to think about CRT's impact in mobility. And we need to make sure that our families are understanding what we're trying to accomplish with dialysis. And that dialysis may or may not be based on how the patients are recovering. So with that, I'll say thank you. I'll be taking questions. If you want to throw tomatoes or comments at me, you're welcome to. The slides are available for download on my Twitter feed at this point. There's a link on my Twitter feed if you go to it. And the slides are available for download there. Uh, for free. I also remind you that if you want to learn more, we have our two-day CRT Academy in August this year at Birmingham, uh, and the uh, invitation to register will be coming up soon. So with that, I will end, and we will take questions, hopefully. Excellent. That's a great question. So there is um, there is a lot of um, flexibility that comes with customized solutions. However, customized solutions also carry a fairly significant amount of risk, and there's a lot of cost and work on the uh, nurse. I mean, on the I, uh, IV pharmacy room to customize the solution. And if you have multiple patients on dialysis, getting anywhere from 48 to 96 liters and, uh, per day of CRT solution, and they come in five liter bags, that's an awful lot of work for your uh, IV pharmacy room. I would say most institutions in the world are using uh, commercially available solutions. And that's what we do. 
and you actually tend not to have the whole breadth of the menu that's available. You generally have a 4K option and a lower K option. And then you may have calcium containing solutions and non calcium containing solutions, depending on if you're doing citrate. So at Grady right now, we have two solutions. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Sure. That's great. Okay, furosemide. So the question is, what is a successful furosemide? So more importantly, how do you do a furosemide stress test? Okay, there's very clear definition of this. Uh, furosemide stress test gives Lasix naive patients one milligram per kilo of Lasix. If they have Lasix exposure in the fast, it's 1.5 milligrams per kilo. Okay, so 80 kilo person, it's an 80 milligram dose of Lasix. A response is defined as making 200 cc's of urine within the first two hours. That's a response. Okay? But I think I wouldn't hang your hat on so many numbers on that. You can also just do this qualitatively. You know, they made urine or they did it because it's usually not subtle. It's usually not, oh, they made 190 cc's, but not quite 200. You know, it's usually like they didn't make anything or they made a lot. Okay? Great question. Any other questions? You want to throw anything at me? This was a high level. It's, it's impossible to cover all this in great depth in one hour. I went a little bit over my time. So I hope that at least you got something out of this and you learned something today. If anything, you know that you need to hire more ICU clinical pharmacists, right? All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Connor. We appreciate your time. It's been a great, great talk. All right. There is one question that just came through. Okay. Um, how do you dose meropenem on a patient who is running at six liters an hour? Oh my. Uh, so how do you dose meropenem on a patient who's running six liters an hour? That's tough. Um, we know meropenem is easily dialyzable. I would say that I would be aggressive with dosing, and I would really think about extended duration or continuous infusion dosing. Marina, what do you think? So. Maybe two grams every eight hours or one gram every six hours, and then put them on a uh, you know extended duration infusion, you know, infuse everything over three or four hours, or just give them eight grams a day as a continuous infusion or ten grams a day, whatever. Uh, it's gonna be very hard to overdose them. Um, one of my colleagues, who many of you may know in the pharmacy world, Bruce Mueller, does people know that name in the pharmacy world? So Bruce Mueller from Michigan is a really famous pharmacist who's done a lot of trials on this, and he lectures on this all the time. And he asks people to raise the hand, to think about the last 10 or 20 patients they've had on CRT, and raise their hand if they've actually seen a patient who has a, 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 a toxic effect of being overdosed on a drug while they're on CRT. And very rarely do any hands go up, okay? Now, if the machine is not working continuously, if the circuit is failing all the time, then you're going to get yourself into trouble if you're dosing very aggressively. So if you're doing six liters an hour and it's failing every 10 minutes or every five hours, you may get yourself into trouble. But if it's working all the time, it's going to be very hard to overdose that patient. We have another question uh, regarding calcium levels. Which ones would you find acceptable for citrate-based anticoagulation? Uh, okay, so what levels do we use for calcium for citrate-based anticoagulation? We didn't get into that in great depth. It depends on where you're looking. So first of all, that's important, okay? If you're looking in the machine, if the, you're looking at the, CR, the circuit ionized calcium, that's trying to measure the, the efficacy of how much citrate you're giving. That level should be less than 0 0.4 to have appropriate anticoagulation. In the patient, most of the protocols accept a systemic ionized calcium 0.9 to 1.2. Now, some cardiac ICUs tend to run a little higher on that range, but generally speaking, it's considered safe between 0.9 and 1.2. All right. Yes. Yes. Um, you know. Yeah, that's a great question. So the question is temperature management on CRT. So you're here at Grady, right? So you have, aren't you at Grady? Um, at, at, okay, at Emory University. So um, 
the newer generation machines have much better blood warmers. Um, I would say that you should think about the patient's hemodynamics, because we know that on any form of dialysis, if we let the patients run a little bit colder, they tend to tolerate dialysis better. Okay, so I don't think we should be targeting a temperature of 37. If they're on a bunch of pressors, we may want to set our temperature goals at like 35, 5, 36. We certainly shouldn't be running them hot uh, if they're on a bunch of pressors. Um, so probably a little bit hypothermic because that's been shown in many studies across all different types of dialysis to improve the tolerance of dialysis. And we use it all the time in the outpatient world to chill, chill the patients to allow us to get fluid off of them. So. All right, thank you. I'm gonna turn off all these microphones now and say goodbye to everybody. Amen. Yeah.